Good morning, everyone. My name is Mike Warrell, and uh, this morning we are doing the adult Sunday school lesson for November the 8th, First Baptist Church lesson for November the 8th. And we are going to be in the book of Isaiah, continuing the book of Isaiah, uh, and we're going to be looking in chapter 49. Uh, especially verses 1 through 13. Verses 1 through 13, Isaiah chapter 49. Uh, before we really get into the lesson, let me read a little uh, brief introduction to you that will set the tone for what the lesson is about this morning. Uh, first off, uh, my writer says that there are some things in life that seem impossible. You may get a doctor's diagnosis and that uh, hope for a better outcome than what the doctor has told you may seem impossible. Uh, you may have a relationship that goes bad and you think that relationship is ended and there's nothing that can be done to restore that relationship that you want. Or you may be called into your boss's office and you may think, oh my goodness, this is the end. Things couldn't be worse than this. The people of Israel uh, faced some times when they thought this is the worst news possible. There's nothing I can do to fix this. And we're talking about the time when they were taken into captivity, when they were taken to Babylon and they were held in captivity for 70 years. We learn from the Bible that this took place between the years 586 B.C. and 516 B.C. So the people of Babylon are in a terrible fix during those years. They're being held captive in Babylon. They've been taken from their homes. They've been made slaves. They don't see any hope of things getting better, of them being able to return. But in today's lesson, we're going to see that there is always hope to be held. There's always hope to look for. And we're looking first in uh, Isaiah chapter 49 in verse 1. This, uh, this chapter and these first uh, few verses introduce to us in the Old Testament in Isaiah the introduction of the Messiah. A Messiah that is to come and deliver the people and give hope not just to the people of Israel, but to give hope to all mankind. So let's look at verse 1 of chapter 49 in Isaiah. And it reads, Coast and islands, listen to me. Coast and islands, listen to me. Distant people, pay attention. The Lord called me before I was born. He named me while I was in my mother's womb. This is Jesus speaking. Through Isaiah, through prophecy of Isaiah, he is saying to the people, I want the whole world to listen. There is a time coming when I am going to be born when I will be on earth and I am going to come and I will be the Messiah. The Lord, he says, called me before I was born. This is a plan that God had even before Jesus was born. He had this plan that he was going to send his son as a gift of salvation to the world. The Lord called me before I was born. He named me while I was in my mother's womb. So God knew from the very beginning how this was to play out, how Jesus would be born, the name he would have, how the people would know him. If you look at verses 2 and 3, it's uh, Jesus is a little descriptive about how he would appear and how what he would be like. He says, God made my words like a sharp sword. He hid me in the shadow of his hand. So he's saying there, God made my words like a sharp sword. He gave me the words that I'm going to say. He told me what to say. Some of those words were going to be 
sharp to people. Some people were not going to like what he said. It was going to uh, be disruptive in many ways, uh, and his speech would be because he would be saying things that went against the norm for his time. But God gave him the words to speak. And it says he hid me in the shadow of his hand. Jesus says God is even going to protect me while I'm doing my ministry. I'm going to be protected. Uh, he made me like a sharpened arrow. He hid me in his quiver. There was a time that God was going to send Jesus. And he knew that when that time would be. But in the meantime, Jesus was held in God's quiver. He was, he was ready to be used, but not quite yet. He was being held in God's quiver. He, made, he hid me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant in whom I will be glorified. Jesus was to be God's servant on earth. And God says, in you, I am going to be glorified. When the time comes, you are going to glorify my name. Look over, if you will, to uh, look over to verse four. Verse four says this, but I myself said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and futility. Yet my vindication is with the Lord and my reward is with my God. Well, we know well from studying the, uh, the New Testament, we know that uh, what, we know what is to come for Jesus. Here in the Old Testament, Isaiah is prophesying what is going to take place when Jesus comes. In many ways, I'm sure Jesus felt like what I'm saying and what I'm doing is futile. People are not listening to me. I'm not bringing in disciples like I want to. People hear my words, but they don't respond to what I say. So in many ways, Jesus had times just like us when we feel like I'm doing all this and nobody's really listening. Nobody's really paying attention to what I'm saying. And so in verse four, Jesus says, he says, I have labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing and futility. But look what he says then. He says, yet my vindication, my vindication is with the Lord. That's what makes it all worthwhile. He says, my vindication is with the Lord and my reward is with my God. Jesus is saying, even if people don't listen to me, even if they don't want to hear what I say, if they turn their backs on me, I know that I have done what my father wanted me to do. I have carried out my mission, the mission that God gave to me, and I've done the best job that I could do. So therefore, he says, my vindication is with the Lord. I have done everything I could do, and I've done it the way God wanted me to do it. So, uh, folks, when you get disheartened about things, just think back to Jesus, how he must have felt in his time on earth when he was preaching and teaching and he just couldn't get the message over to, to some people. They just didn't want to listen. I'm sure at times he was frustrated just like we get frustrated sometimes. Look at verses uh, five and six. And now says the Lord, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God is my strength. He says, it is not enough for you to be my servant, raising up the tribes of Jacob and restoring the protected ones of Israel. I will also make you a light for the nations to be my salvation to the ends of the earth. God is saying here, it's not enough that my people that are in exile are going to be returned to their homes. It's not enough 
that my people in exile are going to be returned and rebuild the temple. It's not enough that my people are going to be returned to their homes and start living their lives again like they did before. He says that's not enough. Just restoring my people is not enough. He says, I will also make you a light to the nations to be my salvation to the ends of the earth. He says, the message that is coming with Jesus has to be shared with the entire world. It's not just enough for my chosen people. This is a message that needs to be shared with the entire world because it is good for them just like it is good for the people of Israel. Look at, uh, look at verse 7. Look at verse 7. This is what the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, says to one who is despised, and we he's, he's talking about Jesus' time, when Jesus has his time on earth, God is saying, uh, Jesus, when you're, when you're on earth, carrying out my mission, uh, teaching and preaching to the people, he says, in many instances, you're going to be despised. People are going to hate you. They're going to talk about you. They're going to reject you. You're going to be one who is despised, one who is abhorred by the people, to a servant, to a servant of rulers. Kings are going to look down on you. They are going to reject you. You're going to be like a servant to them. Kings, but the time will come, the time is going to come when kings will see, princes will stand up, and they will all bow down because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, and He has chosen you. So Jesus, uh, God is saying, even though you're going to go through some bad times and people are going to despise you and reject you, He's saying there's a time that's going to come when all the kings of the earth are going to bow down to you. All these people who rejected you, even today, folks, we could say that. Even today, there's people who reject Jesus. And I know that's a frustration to us uh, as Christians that there are people who want to still reject Jesus. But we're told here in the Bible that there is a time that's going to come. It's going to be a day of salvation when all kings, all government authorities, all people are going to see that Jesus has returned and he is the true king. He is the true God of all and everything. And at that time, uh, I guess we will have a certain amount of vindication too because what we know now and what we have known as long as we've been Christians will then become apparent to everyone. Uh, look, at, uh, look at verse 12. This is, uh, verse 12 begins with something rather interesting. It's uh, making a reference to the year of Jubilee. I don't know if you've ever heard of the, the year of Jubilee, but what the year of Jubilee was is uh, once, I believe it was every 50 years, back in the, 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 this time period, back uh, in the uh, biblical days, once every 50 years, they would have what was called a year of jubilee. And uh, during that year of jubilee, if you, owned, if you owed any debts, they were forgiven. If you had uh, property that you had sold to pay debts, that property would be given back to you it would be restored to the original owner. So it was a time, you could say, of making things right again. It was a time of making things right. Man, it sounds like a good thing to me. I, I kind of wish we had a year of Jubilee today. That would be great, wouldn't it, for, for many of us. So in verse tw uh, 8, it says, this is what the Lord says, I will answer you in a time of favor. 
a time of favor. That's like referring to the year of Jubilee. That was a time of favor. The year of Jubilee was a time of favor. And God says, I'm going to answer your prayers and I'm going to restore you and return you from your exile. I'm going to do everything that needs to be done for you in a time of favor when it's time to do it. In my time, when I'm ready to do it, and I know that's the time to do it, I will act. And I will help you in the day of salvation. I will keep you. I will appoint you to be a covenant for the people, to restore the land, to make them possess the desolate inheritance. Saying to the prisoners, come out, and to those who are in darkness, show yourselves. So in this day of salvation, when Jesus is here, all these things that have been bad are going to be made right. It says, uh, you know, it says here, he's going to restore the land. He's going to make people who, who are uh, poor and suffering, they're going, to, they're going to find a better time, a better life to live because of the salvation that Jesus brings. Prisoners are going to be able to come out and see and be changed and see the salvation that awaits them. And it says here that people, uh, they will feed along the pathways and their pastures will be all the barren heights. They will not hunger or thirst. The scorching heat or sun will not strike them for their compassionate one will guide them. In this time of salvation that is to come, everything's going to be made right. Everything's going to be made right. Farmers worry about getting not enough rain. They worry about getting too much rain. They worry about the sun, the heat getting too, too, uh, too much for their crops. But the time is coming, this time of salvation, where everything's going to be made right. Everything's going to be just perfect. They will not hunger or thirst. The scorching heat or sun will not strike them for their compassionate one will guide them. The compassionate one, God himself, Jesus Christ uh, will guide them. One will guide them and lead them to the springs. I will make all my mountains into a road. If you, uh, Notice construction work that goes on when they're building roads. Sometimes they have a mountain in front of them. That mountain prevents them from carrying the road on through where it should go. Well, uh, it, it, this is just about the same as spreading the gospel. You, you have roadblocks in spreading the gospel. There's things that, that pop up that prevent you from being able to, to spread the gospel. But God said, Jesus says here, I will make all the mountains that you encounter, I'm going to make them into a road. And my highways will be raised up. See, these will come from far away, from the north, from the west, from the land of Sinem. Now that word S-I-N-I-M, and I'm not certain I'm pronouncing that right. Maybe it's Sinem, but it's either Sinem or Sinem. And that's referring actually to a place in Egypt. So that's a way of saying, uh, I'm going to have it where people from all over the world can hear my word and be saved. That's, uh, that's kind of like us saying, uh, uh, gee, I'm going to China. Well, you're not really going to China, but it's a long ways off. So that's what this word means. God is going to have it so that people can... Uh, have access to the gospel, to the word from everywhere. They'll have the ways to get there and hear the word. These will come from far away, from the north, from the west, and from the land, we'll say Egypt, because that's literally what that, that word means. Uh, look over to, to the last verse we're gonna take a look at, verse 13. And uh, in verse 13, this uh, is really a declaration of praise, a declaration of praise for the uh, salvation that is going to occur with the coming of Jesus. This is a declaration of praise for what is going to occur. Look at verse 13. Shout for joy, you heavens. Earth, rejoice. Mountains, 
break into joyful shouts for the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. These people that uh, Isaiah has prophesied, has prophesied uh, that will be taken away into captivity in Babylon, he's giving them hope for that time that's to come when they're in captivity. He's giving them hope. He's giving us hope today. He's letting us know that even in times, in bad bad times, like being in captivity for the uh, for the Jews, even in bad times, God is aware. God knows what's going on with us, and He He has promised us that we will be restored. There, the time will come when we are going to be restored to Him when we go through those bad times. We need to stay right with God. We need to not turn away and forget that God is in charge. We, we don't need to think, well, God can't do anything about this. God can do what he chooses to do when he wants to do it. So uh, we keep talking about the year 2020, uh, all the things that have gone on in 2020 that have uh, been bad, uh, things that have caused us much concern, much worry, uh, we've just been through an election. You know, it appears from the election results about half the people are happy and about half the people are not. So we're going through some times of division. We're going through some times of turmoil to a certain extent. Keep the faith because God says I'm in control. And in his time, everything will be revealed to us and we'll understand. So uh, I thank you for being with us uh, this morning. I pray that you have a good week. And uh, until next time, uh, stay healthy and uh, God bless.